have David and Caleb, and I've got to spend the past few hours with them. They're very awesome guys, very down to earth, and so I, I just I don't want to mistake their bios, so I'll read those off, and then we'll welcome them on stage. Oh, so uh, David was that first one. <laughs> oh, Simon. <sorry. laughs> David is a Utah native who earned his bachelor's in science in material science and engineering from the University of Utah in 2010. After a year in a PhD program at Cornell, he just decided to leave, the, leave and start Power Practical. While sitting around a campfire in 2012, David was inspired to find a way to do something useful with wasted energy. With no prior business background, David has successfully recruited a team, launched seven Kickstarter products totaling over $2 million, raised angel and venture capital, and placed products in retail stores around the globe. So that's David, our first guy. Then we've got Caleb Light, perfect last name for the product, um, who's the co-founder, also co-founder and CFO. Uh, he's from Montana, and he studied accounting at UVU. In 2008, Caleb started his first company, Cup Ad, and sold advertising to companies like Overstock.com, Zag, and the University of Utah. In 2011, Caleb joined Power Practical and helped develop the initial strategy of introducing the power pot to the market. Uh, primarily through the use of crowdfunding, since, uh, since joining the team, Caleb has expanded distribution through retailers in the U.S. and in 14 countries internationally. Let's give it up for David and Caleb. Hello, everyone. I'm Caleb. Um, Dang, it's really loud, sorry. I'll try to speak more quietly. Um, first and foremost, before we get into our story, um, just want to reiterate the gentleman that gave the announcement about the business plan competitions. Um, it's something that I leveraged in college, uh, along with my brother who helped me start CupAd. Um, and as a matter of fact, Josh, who went to Utah State, if you Google speed pitch, um, I think it's speed pitch? Elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. El Google elevator pitch. He's like the number one, number two, number three video. And it was from this school, and we won $5,000 from that pitch. So totally do it. Maximize your experience. It's a great thing you should do. Cool. David Toledo, thanks for having us. We're very excited to be here. Now it's my time to be on the stage, I guess. So. <clears throat> Um, we're happy to talk about anything. Like you said, if you have questions, just feel free to ask. Raise your hand, gentlemen. We'll come and bring you a microphone so that everyone can hear, as well as the people that are uh, watching remotely. I'm going to start our story at the beginning. Um, how many people here enjoy the outdoors and like to go camping? I mean, I know us. At our company, I think we have, what, five Eagle Scouts? Maybe six or something. I'm an Eagle Scout. Caleb's an Eagle Scout very active outdoor people. And our story really began sitting around a campfire. And um, we is myself and Paul Slusser, who is the co-inventor of the Power Pot, which is our first product. And we were camping, sitting around a fire, watching the embers go up into the sky and listening to a little set of speakers. And this was even be before Bluetooth. It wasn't even Bluetooth speakers, just little teeny little speakers that um, we had running off, I don't know, like AA batteries or something like that. And the speakers died and, you know, it got really sad around the fireplace because it got really quiet and, you know, it, silence is golden. I do appreciate it myself, but sometimes you, when you're out in the backcountry for a week or so, it's nice to have a little bit of music. And we're both in the engineering program, and um, I was doing my senior project on a class of materials called thermoelectrics. And thermoelectrics take heat and make electricity with no moving parts. And as I was, I was sitting around the campfire without music, I thought to myself, this campfire is putting out so much energy that if we could just harness even a fraction of a percentage, it would be more than enough power to run these speakers. So I posed a question to my friend Paul, who's also in the engineering program, and we set out to create a thermoelectric generator because after the camping trip, we went home to see if there was any sort of device that we could buy and use a campfire to power our speakers, and there wasn't. So that's when the 
journey really began for me was setting out to build a thermoelectric generator. Um, that thermoelectric gener generator ended up being the power pot, um, which is a backpacking pot that makes electricity while you heat the water inside. So we didn't set out to build the power pot. We set out to build a thermoelectric generator, and it ended up being in the form of a cooking pot. And we called that the power pot. And we built it um, when I was a junior, I believe, junior or senior in college. We were living together as well. And we built it in the, the basement of the house we were renting in, in Sugar House in Salt Lake City. We were both going to the University of Utah. <clears throat> after, after building the power pot, it took maybe I don't know, a year of exploring thermoelectrics, buying lots of stuff off eBay and Amazon and really melting and breaking and burning lots and lots of electronics um, before we eventually made a pot that actually could turn on a, a fluorescent light bulb off the kitchen stove. And we thought that was really cool and then we shelved that and both went our separate ways after we graduated. And he went <clears throat> to work for a big company in the Bay Area doing engineering, and I went to start a PhD. After about a year of that, we both got tired and decided, let's come back to Salt Lake and build a company with this idea that we had a couple of years ago. And that's the point where I actually met Caleb. So Paul and I were sitting in a different basement, as it turns out, <laughs> building a business, and we were just a bunch of nerdy engineers, like, working on product, and we realized that we really didn't know how to build a business, or even really what a business was, and we were like, okay, where do we begin? We need an accountant, so, because someone has to keep track of the books, and we don't want to do that, essentially. So, we found Caleb through a mutual friend who was getting an accounting degree. Who still doesn't like dealing with the books. And doesn't do accounting anymore. And doesn't anymore. do accounting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but Caleb was an avid, or, avid outdoorsman also. And when he saw the power pot, I just saw his eyes light up. And you could see the excitement. And he saw the application of the, you know, a pot that, you know, as you're heating water for tea or cooking ramen or whatever you might be doing, you can be charging your GPS or your cell phone or your headlamp. And he, <clears throat> he joined us as like the, the first person to really build a business before we had a product. And then now we were beginning to have a business. So where do you go from just having a product? And how do you, how do you get capital to build more of them? How do you get into stores? How, who are you going to sell it to? Well, Caleb had the idea of going on to Kickstarter. And this was back in 2012. Kickstarter was pretty small. Um, I don't think there had even been a million dollar project yet. I don't think um, so. So we set out to build a Kickstarter campaign and launched the PowerPot on Kickstarter in April of 2012. We sold 1,000 units, um, made enough money though to build or buy the parts to build 2,000 units and all the equipment to assemble the power pots in Salt Lake City. So we rented a little warehouse space um, and then bought all, bought all the machines to do the assembly and bought the parts for 2000 and started to bootstrap the business after <clears throat> successfully raising um, $125,000 um, on Kickstarter, which was about 1,000 units. And then from there, how, how do you grow more is what the question became. And, it was very evident that we needed to raise money and I'll let Caleb take it from there. Yeah, so um, just to kind of reinforce the, the original Kickstarter campaign, um, <clears throat> we, like David said, pre-sold about 1,000 units and, you know, we had, how many power pots did we build up to that point? Ten? Five? Um, about 50, actually. 50? So we, we had built 50 and we needed to build 1,000. Right? That's a big delta. So Yeah, fifty over a year. Over a year, yeah. <laughs> and and now we needed to build a thousand over a summer. So like David mentioned, we rented a space, we bought some tools, and then the 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 four of us, another gentleman named Riley was on the team too. Um, we started building power pots and the coolest thing that I saw that first summer was 
the, the excitement that we generated and the passion that we had, it spilled over to our friends to the point where we had, I don't know, two, three, four people that just showed up almost every single day and, you know, for a little bit of like pizza and some soda or beer or whatever you decide to do um, beverage wise. Uh, that was, that like was sufficed. It was awesome. Like we just bought pizza and random people showed up and helped us build a thousand power pots over the summer. Um, and in my previous startup, uh, I had gone down the road of, of trying to fundraise. And so I had established some relationships with some local guys. And um, one of my mentors, uh, I told him that I was gonna go talk to this investment group in Park City. And he kind of looked at me and just kind of laughed. I'm like, y y you are like way too noob to like know what you're doing to like pull this off, right? So um, David and I went up there, we gave a pitch, and there was this one guy in the crowd that was just like hammering us just over and over and over again. And it wasn't even like points that we felt like were that relevant. Um, and, and when we walked away, we were just like, man, that guy just like hammered us. Um, and then like a week later, we got another phone call. It's like, we loved you guys. We want you to come back. So I told this mentor guy, I was like, hey, guess what? We got a second meeting. And he just like face dropped. He's like, all right, it's game time. So then he kind of helped us um, navigate that, that space. And the guy that hammered us was actually the guy that was the champion within that group to help us um, raise funds. Um, and part of raising funds was we hired uh, um, a gentleman, his name's Matt Ford, he's our CEO, super awesome guy. Um, he came on and we ended up closing the round in January of uh, 2013. And the whole goal um, of raising the money was we felt like we had an interesting model where we could go from Kickstarter and then kind of follow the, the lack of a better way of putting it, the old person strategy of going into uh, traditional brick and mortar, right? That's what everyone does. And as far as I saw it, it was like once you close that door, call it REI, call it Sam's Club, call it Cabela's, call it whatever you want, you would like won. The game was over. Like you might as well buy a boat. Like <laughs> killed it, right? Not the case. <laughs> so we... We closed around, we went to Winter Outdoor Retailer, we started like trying to get into retail shops. Um, we started with the really small guys, because those are people who, like we could call and they could make decisions really quickly. And what we learned is the bigger guys, the REIs of the world, they have these things called buying cycles. So they have a time in the year where they have the ability to buy new products. And outside of that, if you miss that window, you gotta wait a whole year to like get into the store, right? So something that we didn't know. Um, and so we're like sitting there just like pounding the phones, January, February, March, we're getting into April and we get this random email and it's like, hey, I'm a Shark Tank producer and I saw this cool thing you guys have called the Power Pot. You guys should totally apply for Shark Tank. And we like look at each other and we're like, really? It's like, what's the chance of being on Shark Tank? Because I had one of my colleagues in school and in, in college, he, he was on season two of Shark Tank. And he had told me the process that they had went through in terms of they went to like down to Dallas and stood in line for eight hours through like the whole open call. And they had like all these different interviews with different people. And they got up to the point where they actually got accepted and got to go on Shark Tank. And I was like, the probability is just so low of actually making it happen. So the way we looked at it was like, okay, how much time is it going to take us to make a two minute video? Well, about four hours. So it's like, eh, we could dedicate four hours and see what happens. So we like took it in these really buy side chunks. And then in July, so three months later, we were on a plane flying to Los Angeles to go pitch the sharks. <laughs> oh, that's pretty crazy. Um, and so when we got, when we got the, the uh, when the producer told us that we had been fast tracked and that we were going, then it was like, okay, we really need to spend some time and make sure we are overly prepared for what we're about to get ourselves into. So what we did is we had, um, we had a handful of our investors and some other mentors come in and did kind of like a mock sort of Shark Tank where they asked us a bunch of questions and then we would tell them the answer and then they'd tell us that was a really crappy answer and you should answer it this way. So we tried again and then they say that, no, that's worse than before. Let's try again. So. We went through this iterative process of really trying to think through what questions they would ask and what is the most appropriate way for us to answer them, right? Because 
at least at a per, perceive, perception, at uh, some sort of perceived perception, I don't know how to say it, sorry. But um, people, when you ask them a question, if they have a really succinct answer and nail exactly what you're asking, you come off as really smart. And the second you start to ramble, you come off as not so smart because you obviously don't know the answer, right? So we get to LA, we go through the first couple days, like there's a whole day of just listening to a lawyer talk, which was overly painful. Um, yeah. and, and then uh, uh, the night before we pitched, one of my really good friends uh, moved to LA and he came to our hotel room and he sat there for like two or three hours and we had a whole list of questions that we thought they would ask us. And so he just continued to hammer us with those questions and we kept practicing, thinking through how we would answer what's the shortest, most to the point response that we could give. Um, and then we, the next day we went and you, you did the whole like hair and makeup stuff and that was kind of weird, kind of cool, but weird. Um, we had and a then, trailer. What's that? We had a trailer. We ha yeah, we had our own trailer. <laughs> We're like pretty high class, you know? <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, so it's pretty crazy because the sharks don't know who's coming through the door, right? And other than right before you give your pitch, you have about a minute to walk on the set and make sure your props or whatever you have out there looks right and it's in the right place and you're ready to go. And most of them are like on their phones and there's like some hair and makeup people like doing their, their magic before they go to shoot again. And then what you do is you like walk out and this is like the place that you stop and you get to the spot and then you just stand there and it's like this stare down for like 45 seconds until someone claps and then it's go time. And there's like 17 cameras coming in at all different angles and they're just filming this whole conversation, right? And they start hammering some questions and there's literally only one question that they hit us with that um, we didn't expect and it caught me off guard. Didn't catch him off guard because he's way smarter. <laughs> And uh, it, it went super well. We ended up closing Mark. Um, and it's been overly fabulous working with the Cuban companies um, ever since. And so that was June of 2013. And the other kind of interesting thing with Shark Tank is you sign this like really big contract that states if you disclose what happened in the episode before it airs, then you're like liable for what was like five million bucks. Yeah. So. We, we did we, the deal. We What's, did not have $5 million. Which, yeah, <laughs> nowhere near $5 million. Maybe a tenth of that in the bank after her, the first round of funding, maybe. Yeah. But um, we, uh, so we, we did the deal in like July of 2013, and we didn't air till April of 2014. So we had that almost, you know, called 10 months of time when even people within the company didn't know what happened because... They didn't need to know, even though it's a super small company and we're very transparent with pretty much everything that we do. Um, it's like the hush hush, don't tell anyone. Um, and it aired and it was crazy. We saw a huge bump in traffic. There's tons of awareness that comes from it, a ton of credibility. Um, and then you get access to Cuban and his team of really smart successful employees that their job is to make sure you're successful. Um, and so, it, it, I don't know any, any other way of stating it. It was awesome experience, it was really exciting, it was really exhilarating, um, and we get to work with an awesome person like Mark, so. That brings us back into retail, right? Yeah. So, being on Shark Tank, kind of a big deal, you know, people get really excited, and that includes retailers, so. Um, like Caleb said, we went to the first winter OR and then we weren't able to tell people what happened on Shark Tank, but we were able to tell like strategic people like REI and stuff that, hey, we filmed for Shark Tank and, you know, we're going to be airing. We can't tell you what happened, but we can tell you that, you know, we're going to be on Shark Tank. So all of a sudden we started to close all the big retail doors like REI and Cabela's and Staples and you know, big, big box stores. And like Caleb said, you know, at that point you think you really made it. And <clears throat> um, it, it was a lot of fun selling in. Super fun. But unfortunately selling through a, ended up being a big challenge. So as a small brand, you have very little control over where your product goes in the store, 
what kind of marketing collateral they push out. You know, like the PowerPot was never in REI's mailer, for example, that they send out to every REI me member. And on top of that, it was on the bottom shelf of the cooking section in between a $10 pot and a $20 pot. There's this $150 pot where you're like, wow, why is $150? I'm, I don't know, I don't even care because I'm gonna buy this $20 one. But, you know, we wanted it to be by the solar panels, which we didn't, we pushed for going in, but unfortunately the REI buyer who picked up the product was the camping buyer, and she's like, no, my department is the cooking pots. If you wanna be in by the solar panels, then you need to talk to uh, the accessories, or I forget yeah, what the, the department was called. The dirty little secret, sorry to interrupt, yeah. is that there's actually an uh, argument between the electronics buyer and the camping buyer, and to our detriment, we lost that argument and got merchandised in the camping cookware section. But we didn't know any of that was yeah. happening until <laughs> way after the fact. Yeah. So our experience in retail taught us a lot, which is that um, we don't want to do brick and mortar retail because you have no control um, as a small brand. Going in, if we had known that we had to argue for all these things on the front end, we definitely would have argued for them. You know, we would have put our foot down, said we need to be by the solar panels. Um, we did have a good experience with Cabela's, who is different from REI. REI picked up one of our products. Cabela's picked up three or four, and they put it in the electronics section. So we had this great contrast in between Cabela's and REI, where Cabela's was reordering every few months because they were selling through their product, because they were capturing people that were going in looking for solar panels, you know, people that are looking to charge their devices, not people that are looking for cooking pots. So after having a um, hard time in retail, we, we did a couple more Kickstarter projects during that time, um, and our model was still do a Kickstarter, go to brick and mortar retail. And we were very successful on Kickstarter. Each Kickstarter project was more successful than the first. So we started getting really frustrated, like, why are we doing so well on Kickstarter, but we're doing so poorly in, in retail? And we really had to sit back and think about it because at this point, after a year and a half, two years, we had, burned through all of the money that we had raised from Mark Cuban and the angels and the VCs and we're sustaining our company solely off of Kickstarter projects. So the question became, how, how can we take our success in Kickstarter and translate it to more success down the road? And we decided we're going to abandon brick and mortar retail altogether, stop selling to stores and focus online. And I'll let Caleb explain why. Yeah. Um, so just as a side note, we've successfully crowdfunded seven products on Kickstarter um, and raised, I don't know, two and a half million bucks or something between those seven projects. Um, Kickstarter is something that we absolutely love and I would uh, advise anyone considering anything in the hard, like uh, any sort of physical product, you should totally use Kickstarter. I mean, it... It is an awesome tool um, that we now have available that people didn't have 10 years ago. And you can literally take something that you don't spend that much money to build a prototype. Obviously, there's a bunch of things you should have figured out before you launch a campaign, like how much it's actually gonna cost, how you're gonna build it, how you're gonna fulfill it. I mean, there's these, this sort of checklist, but um, it allows you to um, capture, not only validate a product in terms of customer demand, but you capture all the cash up front. So before you actually have to outlay any cash to open molds or buy the, the, the goods, um, you get to collect all that cash, which is huge. It is, I don't know how to reiterate that enough. It is so utterly important because doing a physical product is very cash intensive. Um, and if you don't have to like go raise money or take debt, you should totally do it. So anyway, um, to go back to what David was talking about. So, uh, the theory of value that we went in raising money was that we could go from crowdfunding into brick and mortar and see, um, build a successful company. What we learned was um, that was really hard. Sell through in brick and mortar is really hard, especially for a small brand, especially if you don't understand the things you need to negotiate when you open a door. Um, you, they, 
just like an entrepreneur professor told me long ago, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you're able to negotiate for. Um, and it's something I didn't really understand. Uh, so we killed off all of our brick and mortar distribution and started fo focusing exclusively online. And the reason was is we, with Kickstarter, um, you have a number of tools that I like to refer to as like sell through tools um, or storytelling tools, okay? Um, one of those is video. Another one is could be like imagery, um, GIFs, GIFs, however you call it. Uh, What's like, how many people here have backed a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign? How many okay. have backed more than 10? <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe we should explain what Kickstarter is then. So Kickstarter is a platform where it's online. You go, you say, I have this idea. I have this funding goal. If I hit this funding goal, I'm going to give you this in exchange for backing my idea. So in the case for the Power Pop, for example, we said we need $50,000 to do this. We'll sell you a Power Pop for $100 now. They're going to be $150 later. So you know, give us $100, and in nine months or six months, we'll sh ship you a Power Pot. Any questions relative to that? Okay, so there's these self-through tools or storytelling tools um, that we, we have become pretty good at leveraging, right? Um, one case to reinforce that is that we've continued to successfully crowdfund or kickstart multiple products. Um, our last Kickstarter campaign finished in November of last year, and in 36 days we pre-sold uh, $500, $511,000 worth of a product called the Sparker, which came out to what, 12,000 units? More like 15,000 15, 15, units in that 36 day window. Um, it's a totally awesome tool, you should totally use it. Um, so we've become really good at you know, thinking about the problem, um, and the solution, and then telling that story through video, through imagery, through text on Kickstarter's platform. But when we went into brick and mortar, you lose all of those tools, um, and you're stuck with a box, right? So how do you take all that, that, all that rich content that really reinforces the story and put it on a box? That, that wasn't working for us, and it broke. So we decided to take the box out of the equation and look at another channel that we could leverage the same sort of tools, video, photos, as much text as we want to put on it. So what we landed on was we should focus on selling on Amazon and we should focus on selling on our website because we have access to a similar set of tools. Um, and then the secondary aspect of it is when you sell into a traditional brick and mortar chain, when you sell through, meaning someone walks into the store and buys your product, you have no clue who they are. Like, other than maybe like some sort of high level persona of who would go into the, that store. But other than that, you, 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 you me or David at, as Power Practical, we don't capture any of that information. We have no way of like touching that person in the future. Whereas if you focus on it more of a, an online channel, you, the customer information that you're able to capture and understand and leverage in so many different ways, whether it be marketing, whether it be product development, um, it, it just enables you to do those sorts of things. So killed off brick and mortar and starting January 1, 2016, we were like, we're going all in for this digital strategy. And month one of last year, called January, we did like 6,000 bucks on Amazon, and we are like, oh man, <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna work. <laughs> but uh, end of 2016, we ended up doubling revenue from the year before, um, and how this year is starting out, and based on kind of the, this whole notion of the customer information that you capture and see what's actually happening, our forecasting has become a lot better, and we're actually on pace to like triple what we did last year, assuming we continue to hit the numbers that we're hitting so far. So, yeah, we're pretty stoked. Um, but that's kind of the, the in a, a quick sort of nutshell, our, our backstory, kind of what we've done, um, where we've played both in uh, launching products, distributing them, brick and mortar, and now online. Um, and if you guys have any sort of specific questions, um, 
you know, how, how we typically like to roll is we like the audience to engage so that um, we talk about stuff that's relevant to you guys. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that we may think is relevant that may not be relevant. So if any of you have any questions, um, let's do this. Okay, we'll start right here. What sort of questions did the sharks ask you and specifically what was the one that caught you off guard? Um, so uh, if, if uh, the, they, they ask like all the same questions that any investor would ask, um, you know, like what's your product, what's the market size, do you have any IP, it's something that people think is really important for some weird reason. Um, uh, the question that caught me off guard especially was that they knew who our direct competitor was because one of the sharks got the mailer from REI that had that product in there and I wasn't expecting them to ask us about that specific product. That's what caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh. How old are you guys? And how old were you when you started? <laughs> um, I... I am 31, and um, so I started Power Practical five years ago, so that put me at 26, and when I started Cup Ad, that was in 2008, so I was like 23, <coughs> 24, I don't know. Yeah, I was 23 when uh, we started it, and I am 28 now, I think. Yeah, 28 still. Yeah. <laughs> 23 plus 5. <laughs> Which is why, you know... We like to joke we had to hire We're going to start, hair. wait, get that guy in the back, then we'll move up because we got a couple more. Before we hired our CEO, I think the oldest person in the company was me. Was you, and you were 26. 26? Yeah, yeah, by like six months, I was the oldest. <laughs> Sorry, up in the back. So for some of us who maybe be unfamiliar, like how many milliamps does the, the product produce and like what have you charged and what other products do you have as well to go along? Yeah, is there any way we can just pull up our website? Um, so to answer your question, the PowerPot, the model we launched on Kickstarter in 2012, it outputted one amp of current at five volts, so yeah. it would charge relative to any USB device. Um, at that time, there wasn't much, or I don't know if anything took there, over there an amp at that any time. Two amps yet. Yeah, and then a year or two later, they started introducing tablets that took up to two amps of current. So it 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 at the time when we launched it, it bridged the gap from call it a GoPro, to a smartphone and could do all of those at full power. Um, and then as far as where our uh, um, products have gone, so uh, it's, actually, it's actually been a really interesting evolution um, in terms of uh, the brand of Power Practical, because when we launched Power Practical, we were known as the Power Pot, right? We had one product, everyone called us the Power Pot. And then we introduced um, some portable batteries, um, and we, we kick-started this little USB meter called the Practical Meter. We sold like 8,000 of those in 30 days on Kickstarter and raised, I don't know, 180 grand or something. Um, and then we, we've transitioned from, you know, a generator to a little USB meter that showed you how much power to portable batteries. And now we're expanding um, pretty significantly into LED lighting. So this product, the Luminoodle, it's a white LED light strip, plugs into USB, it's waterproof. We kickstarted this product. So uh, this is also kind of interesting. Um, we, what was that, 2015? Lumino? Yeah. Yeah, summer of 2015. Yeah, so summer of 2015, we're sitting around a table and we're just like scratching our heads because the summer outdoor retailer, you know, we're trying really hard to expand our retail distribution and we needed a new product to show, right? And so David, being the wicked mad scientist he is, he's like, I have this great idea, guys. It's just like, LED light strip. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? <laughs> and, and so he, he buys like a bunch of random stuff off Amazon. Call it, he spent less than a thousand bucks. Less than 500. Less than 500 bucks, right? <laughs> and we, and the plan was, is we were going to bypass Kickstarter and we were going to try to do a traditional retail launch, okay? And so in the middle of outdoor retailer, David had to get on a plane to go to China to meet Gary, who's actually a guy we work with. Um, he just got in from uh, Hong Kong today at one, and he wanted to come hang out with all of you. Um, so David, the middle of outdoor retailer, when we're showing this new product, was like, I gotta go to China and figure out um, 
you know, lock down all the manufacturing and make sure we could build this thing so that come the springtime, we could do a traditional brick and mortar launch, okay? So at OR, we're showing it and I was just like blown away at like the response. Like everyone wanted to buy one right then. And so we get back, uh, we finish up OR and we have a little team huddle and we're talking about how the show went and I felt really strongly um, that we needed to do a crowdfunding campaign because of the, the, the response that we saw at OR, it was like, we, we can't pass this up. So we decided we were gonna launch a campaign 30 days later, so, which was the shortest we ever went from decision to crowdfund to actual launch of a campaign. Um, and we launched it and that thing did like 380 grand in 30 days. And it was just like, <laughs> head explosion, right? Yeah. So, So then um, one of the other interesting things about Kickstarter uh, is um, you're tapping into a very unique audience um, in multiple ways. One of them is I like to think of them as the quote unquote early adopters, right? The people that um, are willing to kind of go out on a limb to purchase a new product. And then there's a bunch of other interesting things about this class of, of people is that they're one, really forgiving. Um, if, if the product isn't quite up to snuff or there's problems, they'll tell you and it, they won't necessarily not buy from you anymore. Um, and then the other aspect is they're willing to tell you if it's good or bad. So we sold, um, we had, was it 6,000 backers for Luminoodle? Yeah, 6,000 backers, but I think on average we sold like two and a half per person. Two and a half per person, yeah. So we, we, we sold, um, we, 6,000 people gave us money during this campaign. Uh, and then what we do at the end of every crowdfunding campaign, after we ship and fulfill, we send a survey asking uh, for feedback, okay? And from the 6,000 people that we hit for the survey, over 2,000 of them responded to our survey, which is like insane um, response rate for a, a product survey. And they requested these five features. They wanted like color changing, and they wanted like uh, a dimmer, an on-off switch, um, I can't remember the other two. Remote. A remote. And so, introducing the Luminoodle color, <laughs> right? Whoa, <laughs> boom, like super long stretch, right? And that one did 400 and something. $8,000 in 30 days, like six months later. So it's like, <laughs> high five. The crowd pulled through again. Um, so, uh, so we did both the Luminoodle base camp and the color. The, the following the Luminoodle, which then led us to this really random thing called, uh, how many people have heard of a bias light? So a handful of people. So it's this like strip that you put behind a TV and then it, it shoots light from behind the TV and it creates, um, it allows your eyes to have something to contrast against. So if you're watching television in the dark, you don't get like eye fatigue and it makes the, the colors truer and just increases the viewing experience. And David being the wicked mad scientist he is, is like, hey guys, there's this thing called a bias light. We should totally look at it. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and more than one person told him that. Yep, I did it anyway, so. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. I, fi I finally came around and like, this is actually a really good idea. So we introduced that in June of last year. Um, An important part of the story, though, is the bias light is aluminum without the tube on it. So we were already making a bias light and saw on Amazon, like, hey, there's a market f already exists for a product that is our product without the tube on it and a sticker on the back. Yep. So Straight up, that simple. Like, we already have the relationships. It's not that hard to make a page, take some photos. Um, and this is a product we did not crowdfund. We took it straight to our online channel. And we've sold, units-wise, more of those than we have of all the other luminals combined. I think more of those than all of everything else combined. More of those probably. than everything we've ever sold combined. <laughs> Since June of last year. Since June of last year, yeah. It's totally, like, head exploded multiple times with that thing. Um, so that's, uh, and then the Sparker, uh, which is not on our website yet, because we, it was most recently crowdfunded. It's a um, flashlight on one end, and on the other end, it's uh, called an arc lighter or, pl or plasma. So what it does is it takes electricity, 
and shoots like a beam of plasma, if you will, across it. And then you can shove it in um, uh, like on paper or some other fire um, leaves, leaves kindling, whatever. and it will ignite the, uh, your material. So, which that's our latest product. And then March 15th, we will launch a new product on Kickstarter, which is totally outside of anything we've ever launched before. So this is the Sparker. Should we watch the video? Yeah, yeah. You can turn it on real it's quick. Short, short one minute video. So we've been getting better at the videos. Caleb has a good input on what a video should have. He leads the, the charge on all these. Oh, Caleb, do you still remember the words? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm already focusing on the next video. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. So this is the, the latest campaign, November of last year, yes? Can you give us a hint of what the next product might be? Uh, yes, it is going to be a heated coffee cup. I'll just tell you what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that's one thing, I mean, just speaking of that, um, here, product for you, and then whoever else, raise your hand, who else asked a question? I know is what I'm <laughs> <laughs> So one thing that I think really um, really holds entrepreneurs back, and especially inventors and um, people that are creative, is they think that everyone is out to steal their idea. And we definitely thought this at the very beginning when we were doing the power pot. And we were very secretive, and we didn't tell very many people about it, and we held it very tightly while we were developing it. And <clears throat> I have some news for everyone. No one cares about your idea unless you're making money already. So no one's going to steal your idea unless they see you're making this money and if I do the same thing, I can make this amount of money. An idea itself is really not worth anything until it's been proven to be valuable. And I can tell you since then we have become l much less guarded about our ideas and because of that we've had a lot more opportunities come to us early on because when you talk about it, you one, develop a better product because you get feedback on it, and two, all these opportunities come out of nowhere because someone's like, oh, that's a great idea. Like, uh, I have this relationship and I'll introduce you to this person and all of a sudden you're making more money than you would have before. So my two cents is, you know, share your ideas with people. Oh, we got a mic already. So I got a question. Uh, how many rounds of funding did you go through? And what was the process of like having your ownership diluted? Like, was that horrible? Was it exciting? Did that happen? I don't think it's ever exciting personally, but <laughs> um, so raising, raising money, um, the shortest time frame that you'll be looking at is at least six months. Um, I personally recommend if you can figure out a way not to raise money, you should, just because you maintain a lot of control. Um, not that like raising money is a bad thing, and not that not not that bringing on um, smart money uh, is a bad thing. It's just you you give up some control. And if you're okay, if you can stomach that, then go for it. If you think you can't stomach that, then you shouldn't. Yeah, you should you should clearly know why you're raising money. Yeah. Um, we were definitely under the impression it's just that's just what you do, right? I mean you have a successful Kickstarter or something and you want to have a successful business, well, then you raise money. That's the first step, right? Well, maybe not always. And the longer you can put it off, the better you'll know your business, probably the better position you'll be in getting better terms from your investors and the smarter you'll be about who you take money from. Um, uh, Mike? Where do you two envision Power Practical going in the next five to ten years? I, I, I'm kind of scared to throw it. It's got sharp edges. I'll let you answer that, David. Where's Power Practical going to go from the next five to ten years? So, how many people thought it was weird that I said we're going to do a coffee cup when we're an outdoor brand? <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's where I see us going. Is um, we we believe that brands of the future are going to be built on the internet and not in brick and mortar retail 
we believe that for lots of reasons. One, you know, brick and mortar retail is dying and the internet is growing. And the other thing is that there is, we believe, direct evidence for this, where there are brands that have been built just online that are direct to consumer. And they, some of them, particularly on Amazon, have products that are completely unrelated to each other. Because we believe that social proof is changing from being how much of the retail shelf and how nice is your packaging look and how many SKUs do you have. That, that right now in retail, that's social proof that you have a good brand. Which is dictated by a buyer. Yeah. Side note. So you have very little control over that. Um, now, when you switch to talking about Amazon, what is the social proof? Reviews, right? You look at it and you say, for example, the white backlight bias light that we have has over 2,000 reviews and four and a half stars. So you see that and you think immediately, that's a good product. Over 2,000 people have said that's a good product. I'm just going to buy it at that point. We think that we can continue to launch products that are kind of unrelated but can stand on their own because each product is getting social proof for itself because now it's not in this group of other products on a shelf. It's, it's already standing alone on a page because no one browses. How many people go to Amazon are like, I'm going to go through this brand's catalog on Amazon. No one does that. You go to Amazon because you're intending to buy something. And then you choose one with the best review. So you're, you're, you're already going with the intent to buy, not to browse, like you might in a retail store. So I see Power Practical becoming a company with much more diversified products um, that's building a brand that is known for having new, innovative, high value, practical products that you find online. Good evening, and thank you for coming. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned that you used Amazon and your own website for uh, marketing your product. Uh, how has social media influenced your sales and what platforms have you used to accomplish that? Social media, um, it's like this big buzzword. Uh, I think it's important um, and there's definitely a, I think that the organic play is getting smaller because the companies that um, um, have the big networks are pushing really hard. Most of them are publicly traded, which means they need to drive up their stock price, which means uh, at the organic level, it's becoming very quickly pay to play. Um, on a paid side, uh, I think it's really interesting, um, especially as a direct consumer brand, because part of uh, the reasoning with going to direct consumer is, I don't know if, you, if everyone understands how, um, um, uh, price pricing works in call it REI. Okay. Typically, how it works is let's say we build a product, um, um, call it the Lumen Noodle, for example. Traditionally, the way it works is if it costs us five dollars, then we sell to REI for ten dollars, and then REI sells to the end user for twenty dollars. Okay. So that right there if we were looking at it in a traditional sense, if we cut REI out, then we in theory have $10 that we can spend to acquire a customer, right? And going back to the point of, okay, if a customer goes into REI and buys it, I don't know who that is and I have no way of touching it in the future, but if I'm willing to spend $10 to acquire that customer, guess what? I can touch them again in the future. I can upsell them, cross sell them, do all sorts of things, which at the end increases the customer lifetime value. So sure, it may cost $10 to initially acquire that customer, but then as you make more, as David's point of creating this diversified product portfolio that provides value and are practical, then it's like, sure, we may have spent $10 to acquire that customer once, but how many times can we sell that person in the future? And what does that end up meaning in terms of the customer lifetime value? Yeah, and maybe someone, we acquire a customer for $5 instead of 10, and then we're like, oh, we need to look for more of these people because we know how, what this five person who bought it for only $5 cost of acquisition, we can find more people that are similar to him or her. I don't know who has the mic now. Just stand up if you have the mic. Oh, sorry. Hey, so 
you mentioned Amazon. How did you get started online selling? And you have your own website now. Just how did you start that up? Um, so we actually built uh, our first website um, before we launched our first crowdfunding campaign uh, in 2012. Uh, we got introduced to um, the Amazon. We're, we're part of a, a special program called Amazon Exclusives, which we, that introduction came through the Mark Cuban companies. Um, and one of the, the guy that handles business development for Cuban companies sits on our board. And he was really passionate that we should talk to this exclusive team and we should try it. And I'm super glad we did. It's been really, really productive. Um, and then as far as uh, our website now, we just use Shopify. It's like fairly simple. There's like lots of different platforms that um, don't require any or little capital to get it going. And then it's just purely a function of making sure that you, you are telling the most appropriate story to reinforce the value of your products. And then after that, it's like, how do you drive qualified eyeballs to your page? Hello. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, seeing as how you guys have had relative success with, with your business venture, if you had the chance to go back and, and basically talk to yourself before you'd released your product, before you came up with the idea, what is a piece of advice that you would have given yourself? Um, <clears throat> for me personally, as kind of the person who's coming up with ideas and whatever all, it would be the piece of advice I gave you, which is don't be so guarded with your ideas. I mean, share them. You end up with a better idea at the end of the day. Uh, for me, um, there's lots of things I would want to do differently. Uh, but first and foremost, it's like I wouldn't even pursue like a, a brick and mortar distribution channel. I just wouldn't even waste my time. I think that there's potentially a time where it, it would become appropriate for us to explore it again. But when you set out to distribute all your products through a brick and mortar channel, you're left with really no leverage in the negotiation, especially as a small brand, because it, it, at the beginning, at least, all that like our board cared about was like closing doors. And so it's like whatever it takes to close doors, you know? And that necessar isn't necessarily the best strategy for a small company trying to start out. So I, I, my advice and what I would do differently is I wouldn't even think about brick and mortar. I would only think about crowdfunding and then a direct consumer play after the fact. And we're not saying never ever do brick and mortar. It's just that shouldn't be your top priority. It's super sexy and it sounds awesome to like, yes, I closed REI, we're in. That's, that's awesome. But it, it brings a whole new level of problems that as a small brand, it's hard to absorb. Yeah, and, and then you kind of have the power. Like Best Buy came to us wanting to buy the bias light and they told us, you know, how they want to buy a thousand and we just laughed at them, you know? It's like a thousand, that's, why? That, that we sell a thousand in a week or less, you know? So don't waste our time. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really fun when the the leverage and the conversation shifts. Yeah. And like, then the conversation became like, well, what if we put our brand name on it? And you know, then then it leads down a more interesting road, at least for us. Yep. Got it. Okay, coming from a business background, I don't really have much expertise making technical like decision or understanding how to make things work. But I have ideas that I want to go and create. How do you recommend I find people with, um, I don't know, the ability to create my, oh, we have to bring my ideas to life, I should say. We got two slides, and David's going to walk through one of the two right now. <laughs> So this is how we approach new product development at Power Practical. Step number one, find similar things and buy them. This seems really obvious. You have something to say? Yeah, I think step one is finding a problem and then looking at what solutions will solve that problem, which leads you into step one. Yeah. D don't go into it with a solution and then trying to find a problem. That's the broken way of product development. So, sorry. I would agree with that 
So once you have found your problem and you believe you know your solution, then go find similar solutions and buy them. This seems really obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. So um, get on Amazon, look for similar products to what you're thinking about doing. This may involve doing more than one product. So what I mean by that is you might have five features you want in your product, but there's similar products where this one has two of the features and this one has two, and then there's a third product that has one of them. Well, just go buy all three, use all three of them, see what you like and dislike about them, and then start taking them apart. AKA break them. Yeah, sometimes with a hammer, it's true. <laughs> and don't try that first though. Um, take them apart and, and try and understand one, how they work and how they're made, and also why why were they done like that? Because a lot of the times you'll 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 learn about why something was designed the way it was. Like maybe one of the features that you have for your product isn't in this product because it wouldn't work, and you would understand that if you had bought it and used it and taken it apart. From there, build prototypes from scavenged parts. So take it apart and start building something new from it. That's how we do all of our product development at Power Practical because um, for the coffee cup, for example, we're not going to go open a mold for a cup when we can just go on Amazon and buy a cup for $10 and take it apart. You know, that, that's one, a lot faster, and two, a lot, a lot cheaper. So it seems obvious, but that's, that's where you start. Sometimes you might end up building lots of prototypes that just do one feature. And it's important to, whenever you're doing product development, to have this is where I'm trying to get, this is my goal, and make sure that your goal is defined and achievable. And then you can build something that just proves that one thing, and it doesn't have to all be put together, you know? Like maybe for my heated coffee cup, all I want to prove is that I can make a wire hot, you know? The wire doesn't have to be in the cup to do that. It can be outside the cup, you know? So set well-defined, easy goals, or maybe not easy, but <laughs> achievable goals that you can say, okay, I've gotten there and now it's done, or I tried and it didn't work and I learned this and this and this from it. From there, really think through the look and the feel and, and the features of it and start thinking of your product from a higher level. And you know, you're gonna take what you learned from one and two and put it on a piece of paper. And for me, I can draw on SolidWorks, I can draw on a computer, I cannot draw with a pen and paper to save my life. So I'll start out just bulleting things out because I can organize my thoughts and I can explain it to someone and then um, I actually, I have industrial designers that work for me now, so I explain what I'm thinking and then they start drawing it, in my case. Um, the place to start is with your inner network. Once you have this bullets and this list and you've defined what your product is, like I said, don't, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with people that you trust as far as you feel comfortable doing. And then from there, it gets a little more complicated, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you might have to hire an industrial designer or you might have to find another student that has that skill or you might need to hire an engineer or find another engineering student to work with and I can guarantee you there's plenty of engineers that would be happy to find a business person to work with. So, um, big, a big help for me when I was starting my business is we joined, um, I joined this entrepreneur group called The Foundry down in Salt Lake City. I like to call it Entrepreneurs Anonymous because it was just <laughs> this group of entrepreneurs that got together and they just talked about their problems and, you know, it was like a peer support group where you, you know, you didn't really learn a lot in the sense of there's no mastermind that knew all the answers, but you're all helping and supporting each other. And through that, we made a lot of connections and hired a lot of people and found a lot of contractors and a lot of people that we do business with still today is from, from that group of people. 
and then from there, you know, start making a a prototype that you can say is a minimum viable product. Let's say so. For us, we will literally we're we're going to do a Kickstarter next March on this coffee cup and. How we're doing it is I buy stuff off Amazon, I take it apart for the metal parts, the electronics um, we put together from scrap pieces, or not scrap, but parts that we buy off the internet as well. And then the outside, we have 3D printed. So it, it's really not that cost in, intensive, honestly. Like for one of our prototypes, we're in it less than $50. But it's just, you have to realize that what you're making is what's going to go on Kickstarter and it's probably going to change. And it's a little bit hard to know what's going to change in the future. That's where experience comes in. But as long as you're, you're willing to accept that the idea is going to change and that the factory that's making it with you is going to help you develop your product to be a better product from being more manufacturable, then um, you'll be able to make that leap. It's, it's not that big. You just have to have an open mind. And then send it to a manufacturer once you have a prototype. And I mean literally send the prototype to the manufacturer because they're going to be able to take that and say, oh, okay, I see how it's working. This works for you know making 10 of them, but if you want to make 10,000, we need to change all these things. It'll look the same. It'll feel the same. It'll function the same. It'll be built completely different. It's totally fine. Where to find a manufacturer? Um, that's really difficult. And if people want to talk about that, I can. But I'm um, not going to go into that right now unless there's real demand. Does that help? OK, perfect. Well, we want to thank David and Caleb. Thanks. There's some gifts for you. Thank you. I think you've inspired us all to go out and be entrepreneurs. So thank you very much. Can I, can I give one parting two cents? Yeah. Sorry. Parting two cents. Um, I think that these things are, are cool. I think they get you pumped up and excited, and that's awesome. But if you really want to like learn and do it, just put your head down and grind. That's the only way you're going to learn. It's the only way I've learned. It's the only way David's learned. It's like, just go do it. Like, Drop the fear and go do it. So, yeah. Thank you.